So now let's start the fun. <laughs> um, probably won't get into this too much, but I'll try and get a good din so that we'll stay on schedule. Um, so this whole chapter is on Piagetian cognition. Um, so first of all, we have to talk about what's cognition. We hear this term all the time, cognition. What is it? What is cognition? When you hear cognition, what do you think of? I'm curious. Have nothing? <laughs> yeah. Thinking or? Okay, so thinking is a cognitive task. What else are cognitive tasks? Thinking, it's a big one. <laughs> Problem solving, learning, memory, concentration, building up strategies, right? Language, all those things that we think about in the frontal lobes, which is executive functioning, learning from your mistakes, all these things are cognitive. Everything we do on a daily basis that's not biological is probably cognitive. So, I mean, things, I mean, we're highly cognitive. People are walking around with this thing all the time. I'm, I'm telling you, I, I'm seeing <laughs> people walk, I saw a person today walk into a lamppost, right? Just walk <laughs> right into the lamppost. Um, and then go, oh, sorry, and then realize it's not a person, it's a lamppost. Uh, something, something's going to give, right? So talking on the phone, looking at the time, um, texting, um, you know, working on your computer, learning, memory, concentration, memory. <laughs> so all these things are cognitive. Think of mental processing. Everything we do with our mental capacities is pretty much cognitive. So, oh, who's she? John Piaget, not him. <laughs> <laughs> Piaget is a neat character. He um, is actually, he was Swiss, and he was kind of a Darwinian type in that he was very um, inquisitive as a child, especially with animals. He was interested in natural sciences and learning about animals, and at 10 years old, he was hanging around at the Museum of Natural History. And he would go in there, and as a 10-year-old, I mean, that's, or sorry, as a 5-year-old, that's kind of, you know, bizarre that this young kid would be hanging around and reading about animals and their behaviors and wanting to learn about them at the museum. So one of the curators at this museum in Switzerland took him under his wing and started to, you know, let him explore and train him and do things with him. And at 10 years old, Piaget actually published his first paper <laughs> on the albino sparrow, nonetheless, but still, it was a publication in an academic journal at 10 years old. He then started to study um, at the University of Zurich, I believe, and he got his PhD at the ripe old age of 21. So a bit of a genius. He then started to dabble in psychoanalysis, and started to explore more of the psychology. He went away from the natural sciences, went into um, psychoanalysis. And a kind of a serendipitous thing had happened with Piaget. He was interested in psychoanalysis, but if you're familiar with the IQ test, we'll be talking about that in, I think, an upcoming lecture. Um, the IQ test was developed by Simon and Benet. Are you familiar with this from, okay. So Piaget was actually recruited by Simon and Benet to help them standardize these tests that were being used to assess intelligence in children. And he didn't really want to do this, but he said, okay, I'll, you know, I'll help. And this was actually in Paris. So he went to Paris to help standardize these tests of intelligence, and he hated it. It was very um, statistical, and you know, standardization is boring as hell. So he never finished it. But when he was working with the children and interacting with the children and in, in, in working with these kinds of tasks that they were using to assess IQ, he became really interested in the kinds of mistakes that children were making. He realized at that point that what Simon and Benet and these other researchers were missing were well, they were asking the wrong question. It's not how much children know, but how they know. Not how many mistakes they were making, but what kind of mistakes they were making. He realized that children's knowledge wasn't just downsized of adult. It was qualitatively different. And so he became really interested in how children learn, how they build their cognitive uh, structures, or basically knowledge, right? So he started to investigate the kinds of mistakes that children made. 
and he became interested in how children think and how they reason that makes it not quantitatively different, but qualitatively different, different in kind, right? So one of the things he did, again, was ask them questions, and how they responded, he noted it was different than how older children um, would answer questions. So here's an example. If you show a child these five blocks, and then you show them these five blocks, and you ask them, which one has more? What do they say? Which one has more? The one on the left or the one on the right? The one on the right. And why do they say that? Because they're spaced out. The children are spaced out? <laughs> spaced out kids. Exactly. Because, because the blocks are, again, spaced out. And it looks bigger, right? And this, again, is called the inability to conserve, or to, uh, in this case, inability to, inability to conserve number. So they're unable to focus on number, in other words, conserve it, and they're distracted by the spatial um, location here, and appears to be bigger. So again, this is what we call lack of conservation, all right? So children usually don't um, succeed at this task until they're in the pre-operational stage, which we'll talk about uh, either today or Wednesday. So again, what do you think? Do children reason less because they know less, and then they just accumulate knowledge in quantity, or is it because they are qualitatively different? This was the question that Piaget was actually asking. So he had this uh, particular, this is actually a task. Suppose you were given a third eye, and you can put it anywhere on your body. Where would you put it? <laughs> Where are you going to put your third eye? Anybody? In the back of your head. That would be good during exams, especially scantrons. Where else? Put your eye. Your eye. Any other place that would be optimal if you could put it anywhere else? If you had, come on, you got a third eye. Where are you going to put it? You're not going to take advantage of this situation? In one of your hands. Okay, and that would be good for exams too. Oh. <laughs> so they asked this question to children of various ages. And here we go. Um, so we have children of various ages, uh, 9 through 12. So grade 4 up to what, grade 6. So they ask these children, suppose you were given a third eye, and you could choose to put this eye anywhere on your body. Draw me a picture to show where you would put your, your extra eye, and then tell me why you would put it there. All the 9-year-olds placed the third eye on the forehead between their two natural eyes, right? So again, in the here and now, they're not really thinking beyond you know, the, the norm. They're thinking where it could be, and of course, in the middle would seem a natural uh, place to put it. So it seems as if these children called on their concrete experiences, so things that are based in the here and now um, for their assignment. So eyes are found somewhere around the middle of the face in all people, so they would again stick to this. One nine-year-old boy remarked that the third eye should go between the other two because that's where a cyclops has his eye. <laughs> the rationales for the eye placement were rather unimaginative, right, among these, these uh, nine-year-olds. So another guy, uh, Jim, nine and a half, I would like an eye beside my, my two other eyes so that if one eye went out, I could still see with, with two. <laughs> <laughs> like a backup eye. Um, Vicky, age nine, I want an extra eye so I can see you three times. Um, Tanya, age nine and a half, I want a third eye so I can see better, right? So this, again, is really not very imaginative. It's based, you know, on what they know, their reality as it is. In contrast, however, the older formal operational, and we'll talk about these different stages, formal operational is where you start to be more hypothetical, think abstractly, so there's a qualitative change in how you um, use information. So these were, um, again, not at all dependent on what they had already seen in life, so they weren't stuck in the concrete world. Um, these children um, formed hypothetical situations and provide rather imaginative rationales for their extra eye locations. Here are some uh, responses. Uh, Ken, age 11 and a half, this is only two years older. He draws the extra eye on top of a tuft of hair. 
so that he could revolve it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Almost like back and around uh, in all directions. <laughs> um, age 11 and a half, draws his extra eye in the palm of his left hand. Uh, and then he can see around corners and see what kind of cookie I'll get out of the cookie jar. Uh, Tony, age 11, draws a close-up of a third eye in his mouth. I want a third eye in my mouth because I want to see what I'm eating, right? <laughs> so, um, again, um, when asked their opinions of the three-eye assignment, many of the younger children, under nine, wouldn't even say where the third eye should go. Because at that age, you can't have a third eye. That's stupid. Nobody has three eyes, right? <laughs> so, again, they, they couldn't even play the game. This is so silly. I don't even want to be any part of this, right? So, again, a, a nine-year-old, this is stupid, nobody has three eyes. However, the 11 to 12-year-olds really enjoyed the task and continued to pester their teacher for more of these fun art assignments, right? So the results of this demonstration are, again, consistent with Piaget's theory that older children um, who are approaching formal operational or getting out of the concrete or the here and now um, start to generate very creative responses to these hypothetical propositions um, in uh, development of knowledge, right? So, again, here we, here we have uh, the 11-year-old. <laughs> this is the picture. Nine-year-old, uh, you know, <laughs> kind of cute. Uh, and the 12-year-old, of course, uh, in his hand, right? So Piaget, he viewed quality or, uh, development again as, this is really important, as qualitative, that there's changes in kind, in how you view information, and not so much in the changes in the amount. You just don't build up and know more as you get older. You actually change um, the kind of uh, knowledge that you have. So he has two actual aspects here, the process versus the content. Process is how we come to build our knowledge base. So again, it's not the amount of content that you have, but it's the process by which you incorporate new knowledge. And this for Piaget was an actual process that you had to engage in the environment. He believed that it was an interaction, right, with the environment and learning. So for him, the child is really a lone traveler in the world. And the child is, again, exploring their environment, learning things um, as they go through life. So again, children are not just little adults, but they, and having less knowledge, they have to adjust their internal concepts. And for Piaget, he called these schemes. And schemes, again, are the kind of, um, I guess, mental representations that we all have that's a way to categorize information. So let me give you a good example. Um, we all have schemes that help us to um, store information and to incorporate new information. So you might have a scheme for, let's say, um, language. You might have a scheme for mathematics. You might have a scheme for relationships, a scheme for whatever the case may be, animals or categories of things, right? And as you're incorporating new information, you can readily incorporate or assimilate new information to your existing schemes. So if you have a very high verbal ability and you're taking a class that's verbally based, you should have no problem incorporating new knowledge. But if you go into a class where the knowledge is now something you've never seen before, it's very different, let's say it's a type of, uh, usually this happens in mathematics or you're starting to take maybe a higher advanced physics course or organic chem or statistics, so those kinds of courses that you can't readily assimilate or, let's say, fit in the new knowledge. And this usually is what creates our difficult courses, right? You can't readily learn them. You've got to think and adjust and try and fit this into some category in your mind. And for Piaget, this is exactly how we learn, by adjusting our internal concepts or building new ones when the old knowledge doesn't make sense anymore or doesn't fit. So we are constantly constructing and then rebuilding or reconstructing our model of reality or really our knowledge base, all right? So because of that, he is often labeled a constructivist, that we build our knowledge based on our experience, and when we're learning something new, if it doesn't fit with an existing concept that I already have, I'm going to have to build a new one. So not many people come into, let's say, an advanced statistics course with all these schemes already there and everything just fits in nicely. You might have to build a new understanding or a new concept. 
That for Piaget is how we build or construct our knowledge base. And if something doesn't fit well into your knowledge base, you have to struggle to try and make one. And that's how past experience can help you, which is why we have different levels, right, of, of let's say, classes or prerequisites. Because if you were to go into, let's say, a fourth year advanced class without having year one or two, you wouldn't have the existing knowledge base, or in Piaget terms, the constructs or the schemes to fit in this new knowledge. You have a very difficult time, all right? So again, he has been hugely um, uh, relevant when it comes to pedagogical development and how we actually structure our levels and our, and our educational uh, system. So two major aspects here, the process of coming to know, which is again how we build these schemes, how we fit new knowledge in, and then the stages that we go through. And for Piaget, and this is where some of the criticisms will come out with Piaget theory, I mean, nobody is going to knock Piaget down. I mean, he's, he's, he's you know, an entity on his own. Um, he's an educational or psychological icon. But people now, today, with our advanced types of research um, uh, you know, innovations, we can now test things that Piaget couldn't do. So when people start to tear apart his theory and say, well, you know, this can happen earlier than Piaget said, they're not saying, you know, he was an idiot. They're just saying that maybe some of these may not be in the way that the theory is. But everybody, of course, agrees that we do pass through these stages, um, although Piaget believed that it was all or nothing within a stage and that you have to acquire a knowledge in stage one before you went on to stage two. That might be a little bit problematic today, okay? So first of all, the process. And again, um, this is based on attempting to reach what I call cognitive equilibrium, meaning a balance. So you come into a class, you have an existing schema or knowledge base, you're learning something new, you can fit it in, and I mean, you know that when you can read something and attach it to what you already know, learning is facilitated, right? Because you link it to what you already have there. It's like, kind of like knitting. You fill it in and you weave this knowledge base, and it's readily assimilated into your existing knowledge structure. If, however, the knowledge is something different and it doesn't fit well, and you have to, what is that? Well, what does that mean? How can that be? What you're doing is accommodating it. You're building a new schema, right? Make sense? Okay. So for Piaget, this is how we actually build our knowledge, through assimilation, which happens readily, and through accommodation. Oftentimes, we have disequilibrium, where we're at a balance. And you might be right here, you can't fit something into your existing knowledge structure. It's not fitting in well. We are motivated to maintain equilibrium. We try and find a way to make it fit, right? And we're not happy until we do understand, hopefully. So this is just an example here of what assimilation is. So a child um, might actually see this, and then this is readily incorporated, and then they see a chocolate bunny, and you know it might be something new visually, but it's readily incorporated in their existing schema of what a bunny is. So yes, it's a bunny, it's a bunny, it's a bunny, right? Fits into existing knowledge. Readily assimilated. Here's accommodation. <laughs> where you now see a bunny, and this is no longer equal. What the hell is this thing, right? Um, so they have to actually accommodate it, where the changing of a new cognitive structure based on new experiences. And you often hear young children, this is really funny, um, uh, you know, you bring a child to, to a zoo or to a, to a, you know, where there's animals around, and you might see this little two or three year old looking at a lamb. And I, I remember actually witnessing this, um, this little kid, um, saw a lamb for the first time, I, su I suppose. And he says, oh, mommy, look at the fluffy doggy, right? And everybody started to laugh. The little boy started to cry because he was embarrassed, right? Um, so again, you know, you have to now accommodate. I know. This is how you learn, though. <laughs> Learning is tough. So he now has to change his schema for what doggies are. Now, now we have a new one, maybe called lambs, right? In this case, of course, kangaroos is not a rabbit. So this whole process of assimilation and accommodation is how we build our knowledge base. So I'm going to end up here, but I want to just talk briefly about the stages before we leave. And that is, every once in a while, your theory is so wrong that you have to reorganize your whole way of thinking, that you reach a plateau, and now all of a sudden you get that aha moment. 
For Piaget, this represented the stages and the movement throughout these four stages. He believed that all children pass through these in the same order. That, by the way, today has not been disputed. Children do go through these stages in this kind of linear progression. And here they are. And we'll talk about these next class. Okay?